I am unashamed. What about you? So today, in the the first time in the lair, uh, we have uh, my preaching partner, Mike Kellett. Good Mike to be and with I, you. yeah, Mike and I have worked together for well on two different stretches. You were our youth pastor uh, for many years when we came back to White's Way Road. Yeah, I was from eighty uh, five. To ninety eight. So, and you you went to the same school. So that's what got you to West Monroe because we used to have a seminary. That's yeah, that's actually when I met Phil first. Right. Because in the 76, 77, I came down and uh, OCS had just started there at Watchfield Road at the church building, and my buddy that I was my roommate Gary Stevenson uh, started doing filming stuff with you, Phil, yeah. back then, and and helping us build duck house. Yeah. I remember he used to have all the footage laid out there on the table. Yeah. You know, and he's cutting and splicing. And yeah. yeah, in the old days, the editing process. That was a low tech. <laughs> yeah. Cole, Cole Man back there would have a, it'd be a whole different world doing those early videos. He, and he, you know, he was he was teaching and working, and then he worked at State Farm. He worked the whole time he did all our videos, yeah. which was amazing. Dad called him Steady Eddie. And, of course, he's Dan. You've heard us talking about Dan uh, all the time on the podcast. He's his dad. So, you know, there's a family connection there. It's, you know, he's always been around. Of course, I don't know if you know this, Mike, but Dad asked Stevenson, when, tell, tell what, what you asked him after you'd been around him a little bit. I don't know if we told that on the podcast. When you asked him if he was a, an angel or oh, a, No, I, I, I investigated <laughs> him. I observed him. <laughs> I said, Stevenson, I've got this thing down to a couple of things. you either some kind of angelic being that's sent down here to spy on us. Because <laughs> uh, there's a passage in Hebrews, right, that says, be careful. Angels unaware. Yeah, because yeah, if yeah. You, you entertain. I thought he might have been one of them. I said, or, <laughs> I said, if you're not some kind of angelic being that's sent down here, I said, you may be some kind of squirrely dude. I said, whatever it is. I said, I noticed you don't date. You, you you don't ever mention a woman's name. I said, you know, you're 25 years old. I said, so what's the deal with that? He said, well, I've learned to buffet my body daily, as Apostle Paul said, to keep it in check. I said, well, that, that, that solves that mystery. I said, what about some kind of angelic being? He said, no, I'm a human. <laughs> so I was, I've never thought about that. I said, well, i tell you what, you about as straight a cat as I ever run up on, i tell you that. So, which is a good thing for Pete. Think about it. So you were so impressed by this man's, the way he handled himself. I was impressed. That you thought he could have been an angel, not even a human being. I mean, that's. I said, he's either too good to be true or he's up to no good, but he <laughs> is one slick dude. Is all I got to say. But I'm thinking to get to the bottom of it. So he's a long time friend. And, yeah, and shared know. the gospel with me. Oh, that's right. I up at Arkansas that. State University. We he's the one that led there. Mike to Christ. Yeah. So uh, we. Uh, and uh, Dan is, as it turns out, is a lot like him. It is. Dan, he doesn't date, nothing, no. Uh, he so yep. most people look at him and say, I don't know, do a good dude, you know. He, well, how just, old is it? He's about thirty five. <laughs> but Dan says, I said, Well, Dan, one thing for sure, if you don't marry and all that, I said, it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, not only that, I mean, the Apostle Paul did call celibacy a gift. I mean, he, he plus he did say, people who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. A lot of people say, that ain't in the Bible. I said, oh, it's in there. Yeah. Read Dad, that Corinthian text. Dad read it at Sadie's wedding. Which is, <laughs> yeah. You know, she's looking around. <laughs> she thought it was pretty funny. So, so Mike, you were the – so the first stint, um, it was really good for me because you kind of took me under your wing. I, You know, I've told my story before. I was a prodigal, came back, got married. I was a new Christian, you know, trying to figure stuff out. So – I kind of had a heart for ministry, and so you kind of took me under your wing because you were already doing new stuff. And I was too old to do any of that, but I was just kind of a – you just kind of took me places. Well, you know what was fun about that? I was thinking about this driving out here this morning because uh, I, I remember following you out here when I first met you. What was that old car you and Lisa had that broke down all the time? It oh, was some the, kind of form. It was a, Hyund- a Hyundai. A Hyundai or I, something. I bought it. Here's how I bought that car. So I bought that car. It's the first brand-new car we ever had, and – you know, fairly early marriage. And the only reason I got it is remember that terrible hailstorm we had when I was in the school of preaching. And that thing was beat. I mean, <laughs> it looked like somebody had taken a baseball bat to it. So they were selling them like super cheap because they had to get rid of them. And so I got that car for like 3000 bucks, a brand new car. But, but 
I got a three thousand dollar car. That's, what, that's what I got exactly. Yeah, because that thing broke down a lot, a lot, and uh, I remember that thing was a piece of junk. One time, one time uh, I was coming out here, and it was a stick, you know, and I couldn't get it. It wouldn't change. Go into the, the next gear. It just locked up on me, and so I, I'm just I'm sitting up there. I'm three miles up the road, just turning on to Leanne. I couldn't get it in gear, and I was just like, I'm popping the clutch. I, you know, I don't know how to work on anything, but it would go in reverse. So I just put it in reverse, and I just was looking back over my shoulder like this, and I drove <laughs> three miles down here in reverse. Now, two things happened. One, another car came up, and it was weird because we're hood to hood, and he's looking at me like, why are you, <laughs> why are you, why are you driving in reverse? And I'm looking at him, giving him the thumbs up. like, Welcome to redneck country. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but here's what happens when you drive three miles in reverse. You get a bad crick in your neck. Because I was looking back <laughs> over my neck for three miles, and when I got down here, I couldn't even hardly move. It was yeah. terrible. So. Well, you did prove that you can get somewhere going backwards. <laughs> That's <Yeah. right. laughs> That's it. <laughs> and then I think Dad or somebody that was down here got it into gear, and I drove it back home. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we came down. Lisa fixed up it for us, and we uh, yeah, because we uh, live next door to live next that, door yeah. to your dad there, and then start spending time together. Yep. One thing led another, and then we started just doing a lot of ministry work together at camp and teaching people together. Yep. Uh, you know, we'd get in those veins of reaching somebody, and then they would, in their friends and family, and then we just, you know, that thing would kind of domino. And so... Well, that's uh, what, you know, we talk a lot to our audience about it, because we got a lot of folks, Mike, that are new to Christianity. A lot of them don't have a church home necessarily. or But you got to have good people in your life, you know? And you saw some potential in me. And, and of course, Willie and Jace were in your youth group. Yeah. And so you worked with them. But that's, when you see that, you should act on that. Like that's, you know, iron sharpens iron. And so now all these years later, um, we, we were ready to hire a pastor and I was at the church. And so they just kind of assumed I was going to be the guy. And I was like, you know, I've seen a lot of really good men come here and the pressure of being the main guy is very heavy, you know, and, so, and some men you and I have loved deeply. And so I just said, I just don't want that for myself. You know, I, I don't, I don't have an ego about it. So I pitched the idea that we would we should hire Kellett and me and Mike Kellett we would be co pastor and so Dad was an elder he was for it uh, Stevenson was an elder he was for it because you know they knew us so well but we had a couple of the elders that were kind of like ah, you know you can't have two quarterbacks you know they went through this whole process and I said look you're assuming that Mike and I we we totally trust each other. So, so, it, but it went back and forth. They didn't want to do it, you know. So, so finally, I gave them the out. I said, "Look, let's let's bring Mike in, and you give us three years to try this." I realize it's unique. You don't usually have co pastors I said, "Well, let's try it for three years. If you don't like it, if we don't like it, whatever, I'll go back to being just what I am right now, which was an associate pastor. And Mike can be the lead yeah. guy." And so once I did that, it was hard to argue because I get I gave them the out. You and, pretty well just made a big circle, and you came back, ended up same spot you took well, off. Well, it was funny because <laughs> then I left. To, I divorced as my said. We're like work wives as husbands. So I left to go to work for Duck Commander, be on the show, and do what I'm doing now. And then that left Mike there to be the guy. But then we hired a young guy, and so he eventually took over about two years ago. And then he left. And so now Mike and I are and back preaching back. again. Got the band back together. <laughs> and well, we're doing it for free. If you look through the... There's not a whole lot of structure and and uh, to the way the church, the kingdom of God works on That's the right. earth. It's not as structured near as structured as the our people across right. America have been made it. They get it the in their mind. It has to years. be done a certain way. And the right? American model is a little stiff. You know what's funny, Dad? Is I feel like right now for Weissfield Road because we spent all of the three of us have spent all of our Christian life there. But I feel like we're probably the closest to first century in terms of our structure, the way we do things, than we've probably been in, since this no church doubt. started. Oh, yeah, and the, no and, the, and the plurality of leadership. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, who wants something that's built around some personality? That's right. right. You know, that's not a healthy thing. No. And so I love the fact of our leaders, our elders, and that's the ministry staff sees it as, as a partner's. That's right. know, there's a lot of a lot of verses that talk about partnerships in the gospel, and so that's I think that's a key thing. Well, when those guys were running, were running around the first century, when Paul was going and, and Silas was with him, or you know, so there's always somebody with him doing just what we did, 
And but when they were going around, these churches were in these cities and they were meeting in homes. We know that for sure. And probably getting together once in a while after that. They would come through with some instruction, but it was the elders of those groups that were doing the day to day and the teaching and all that stuff. Yeah, they were taking care of the discipleship and the meeting with people and sitting down and breaking open the book and, and studying and trying to figure out, okay, what's next to help us grow and mature? Because in, in its simplest form, Christianity is helping people become more like Christ. Yep. I mean, that's the simplest thing about it. You know, if you read in the book of James, if anyone, this is 126 in James 1, if anyone considers himself religious yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. You have to control your mouth. Mm-hmm. And filth does not ever need to be coming forth in your mouth. It's a process. You first come to Jesus, you say, well, I always use profanity, yeah, yeah. But, but that's a pretty, pretty rough statement there. Control your mouth. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Hmm. Well, you know, if you just look at that, you say, you know what? That's about what it amounts to. Right. It's just your daily walk. You get up in the morning, you do good, you do what's right. You reach out to your neighbor, whether they're poor or whatever, homeless, just look after them, help them out, and just that's the way you roll. Right. A lot of people say, well, you know what? <clears throat> We're looking for the deeper truths of the Bible. I said, that's what the deeper truths of the Bible is. That's what they are. That's right. Don't get polluted by the world. Reach out to widows and orphans and help them out. Right. Well, I think people, you know. Simple but profound. There was an example yesterday. A young guy came up and was talking to me about his father-in-law. And he was like, you know, we got uh, to get him plugged back in and doing more things here. You know, like, and, uh, and as we were talking, it just, it, it took me back. Because I'm not there day to day as much as I used to be. And. It's like a misunderstanding. Like, in other words, you can't be a faithful Christian unless you've got a job connected to the church itself. Yeah. You know, driving a van. To, and look, I appreciate the service. Mike, you and I spent most of our lives in ministry. But it's not about that. That That's good, but but that's not what that's not living the no, life you, we're talking you can't, about. You can't create. Because that's what he was asking me. He was saying, can what you can make we do up to a create job a job? To make him get connected exactly. somehow. Christianity is Monday through Saturday. That's right. That's the critical part of one's walk with Jesus. If you ever get it down to a couple hours a week that you report in and then you leave, you say, what about Monday through Saturday? What are you What are you up to then? How do you live your life out there? Uh, we need to get that into people's heads more and more. Yeah. Well, what Phil said in James, basically he says, you, you uh, Christianity's taking care of those that can't take care of themselves. Yep. That's your widows and your orphans. Which, by the way, that's... I don't know of a stronger pro-life statement. Exactly. You're taking care of widows and orphans. That is correct. And then uh, uh, and then keep yourself from being influenced and impacted by the, the worldliness around you. Yep. Uh, it, it's simple, but, it, but it's not easy. No, it's not easy. Yeah, and that, you're right. That's the difference. People say, well, that's too easy. No, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard because yeah. we're submitting our, our whole lives to Christ. But it is simple. Yep. It is, and, and you're right, Dad. These people that these they want these mountaintop experiences, and, and you know, I've been I tell people all the time there there have been people that have removed themselves and went and lived in a monastery somewhere on a mountain, trying to find out the deeper truths. And you can't remove yourself out of, of the whole world. And That's remember, we're here to change the world. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. Yeah, you say, man. He just narrows it down. He said, this thing's not complicated at all. Right. I walked into the building yesterday. I always go away early when I'm preaching, especially. And so, I don't know, it was probably 6.15, 6.30 in the morning. And uh, I go into the building. I turn the light on. I see this girl walking down the hallway at the church building. And she stops, and she's got a blanket with her. And she just starts saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, well, what what are you sorry for? (laughs) You know, uh, well, I know I'm not supposed to be. I said, well, did you get out of the cold last night? I mean, you didn't have a place to go? She said, no. I said, you found a door open? She said, yeah, I found a door open. I said, did you get a place to lay down? Yeah. I said, well, good. I'm glad you did. I, 
don't I'm not calling the cops on you. Yeah. Uh, let me show you a room over here where it's got a couch in there and, and, and a bathroom in there you can clean up and lay down and get some rest and let's visit a little bit more about, about your life, what got you here to, uh-huh. to where you are. Wow. So we had a good visit for a little bit mm-hmm. and uh, uh, I don't know. She, uh, I think she showed back up this morning after I left. Uh, uh, I don't, uh, some of the other brothers and sisters are talking to her. But I told her, I said, look, Hey, it's everybody's just one diagnosis or disaster away from having needing other people in your life. That's right. Yep. And it doesn't take much, and that could be me needing a place to stay. It's so, a little thing. We need to major more than the little things. Yeah, or just like that, being open to people. Let's uh, let's take a break. So one of our Mike, one of the things we love about on our podcast is that we get to enjoy Black Rifle coffee uh, in our in our, our Phil Unashamed mugs. Uh, we love it. It's a, Black Rifle is a, a company that was founded uh, by veterans, and uh, these guys are, I mean, they're the real deal, you know, and so they, they love our country, obviously, uh, and they figured out that if you're in a foxhole somewhere, a good, a good cup of coffee makes all the difference, right? I know it does in a, in a duck blind and also here, uh, as well, so we'd love to tell people about it. Back blackriflecoffee. Uh, dot com slash fill is where you can go check these guys out, and they got all kinds of stuff that you can do. You, you can do gift subscriptions. Their coffee club is wonderful. Every month we get a box that shows up full of black rifle goodness, is what I call it. So we love that. Uh, you can also get a gift card. You know, we want to give somebody a gift. So it's blackriflecoffee. dot com slash fill, and you receive twenty percent off. And that's coffee, apparel, gear. Your coffee club, anything. So it's blackriflecoffee.com slash fill and enjoy some good coffee. Yeah, and I think that's it, Mike. I mean, it's having a heart that there there would have been some place she would have done the same thing somewhere, and whoever that was would have run her out of there. What are you doing in here? What do you, you know, get out of here. You, you know, how'd you get in here? And the very idea. I mean, it's just a building. It's just a building. Yeah, who was the old guy that he was kind of? He was a big dog preacher from somewhere. He'd dress up like a homeless guy and oh, yeah. slip in if, if at his speaking engagement. Yeah, and he would just see how he was treated. He said a lot of time he didn't even get in the door. <laughs> and then, then he <laughs> finally he'd have to tell him, "Look, uh, I'm I'm the one that's going to preach to you tonight." And that's that right. I, yeah, that's. Well, we've said it a lot that. there, Watcher Row. We love everybody. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's. Uh, it sounds almost too too simple but that's how you approach i think that's why our celebrate recovery ministry does what it does yep uh, it takes anybody and everybody and it don't matter what you look like where you come from this is this god invites everybody this yeah. we want everybody we we said before mike that we've one of my favorite things i've heard people say and there have been many that have said it in our community is that um you know they had some troubled kid some kid that can't kick the drugs whatever well, you know, get them over there to that White's Ferry Road Church because they'll take anybody. Yeah, and right. I was like, that's my favorite line about yep. our, our community of believers is that we'll take anybody. And that's true. Oh, it's I true. mean, it's, it's, it's like they used to say about dad. They would say back in the old days, well, get them out to film. Because <laughs> you were like the last outpost, dad. It's like, yeah. well, maybe film do something with him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, you know, basically they were saying you turned your life around. You know, and that's it. I've always thought what... I wanted to do as as a guy who was at our church was since I came home to church because I was a prodigal and came back first to dad's home and then to our community that I wanted a place that always felt like you could come home, you know, that you would be welcomed and that somebody would meet you and welcome you just like you did with that woman. And, and so that's the atmosphere that I would want in a church, you know, to, to be is to have that kind of mindset. You know, we have, of course, at our church, we have the, you know, our response time has been kind of special for us, Al, for a long time. That basically it's an opportunity for people to get prayers, to repent, to be baptized, to whatever their need is. But we always tell people you never come alone. Yeah. You walk down that aisle, you can need help then the brothers and sisters are going to rally around you yep. uh, and give you some help. You're and they did it yesterday. There was a guy came forward, is having a tough time, and there was five or six brothers surrounding him, praying for him, you know, just saying, we're here to help you, which is a blessing. I love that. It's always been that way, which is cool. But we're going to talk a little bit today, kind of pick up where we left off um, from the last podcast, because we've been talking, Mike, Mike and I have been preaching 
uh, primarily at our church, uh, out of where we are in John. We're right in the same area um, in our preaching. So we're doing a lot of this study uh, together, which has been really good for me because I get to hear Mike preach yesterday, fantastic sermon, which hopefully we'll have some time to get into uh, on the podcast today. Jace has preached there once when the dad works across the river at a plant we have over there, um, and we've talked about that before. It's a primarily African American church, and it's but it's going really great. A lot of visitors come great. every week. I mean, it's been great. You, they baptized you baptized somebody baptized a couple baptized people yesterday. three three yesterday, which is fantastic. So there's a lot of good stuff going on out of this context, and we've been talking about you know on the podcast the book of John because we're basically saying. As Dad said early on, what's wrong with Jesus? Why, why can't we make a case for Jesus, right? I mean, you look at it, you see the, all the problems in the world, and we know what, what would solve every single one of them is if uh, the, all these, the, the racial unrest, the social justice, the, all the things you see could be solved in Christ. Yeah. Every single one. Yeah, and people are just, uh, uh, for whatever reason, they're blinded to the simplicity of that answer. But when you look at the book of John, he says that the John was written and he wrote these specific things John did so that people could see who Jesus is and by believing in him find eternal life. Right. So that's, that's the purpose of the whole book. It's interesting to me that he starts the book uh, with creation. Yep. In the beginning was the Word, Word's with God, Word yep. was God. Word became flesh. Yep. 114, where Jesus basically pitched his tent with us for a while. He was live, and, and he was live. Yeah. yeah. And so then when you get down to the crucifixion, which I think you guys have That's already been talking at, yeah. about, that Jesus on on the sixth day of the week, he dies. On the seventh day of the week, he rests. And on the first day of the week, newness all over at the resurrection. Mm-hmm. It almost echoes the creation story all That's over right. again. Yep. I hadn't thought about that. That's exactly well, right. And and starting in Matthew 16, what's amazing, a lot of people, they don't realize that Jesus repeatedly said, from that time on, this is Matthew 16, uh, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Matthew recorded that over and over, and so did Mark and Luke. When you get to Jesus, when I'm lifted up, you know, by this, he meant the kind of death he would, and all of his disciples. I guess every time he would tell them that, it is written what the prophet said about me, you know, like Isaiah 53, like a root out of dry ground. They pierced him for our, you know, he was pierced for our iniquities. So it's not like he was surprised when he finally gets to where we are in the book of John. When Peter preached about Jesus, he said, by God's set purpose in Acts 2, he said, and foreknowledge. This was all planned out in advance. Nothing was going to stop it. The sins of the world would be removed, and they would have the opportunity to be raised from the dead. And he did it all. What's amazing is it took about, Four or five thousand years to get him here, you know the prophet Jesus is coming. Once he arrived, he actually pulled it all off in three days. That's right. Solved the sin problem of the world and physical death problem that they have in three days. You're like, how in the world could somebody ever pull that off? That's right. It was crazy. They didn't I don't even, believe you could have dreamed it up. No, no, you can't make it up, and no. they they didn't realize it even though they're here and being with him three years. Yeah. Uh, because after he does die, the disciples retreat back to a house, and they're scared. and They hit the road. And, and, yeah. And they're <laughs> like, so they're not expecting him to be raised from the dead, even though he, even though he said he's going to be. I guess every time he, he would tell them that, Al, I guess they would, you know, Peter would look at John, and they'd look at each other like, what did he say? He said, he said he's going to die, be buried and raised from the dead. That's what he said. But evidently, uh, Kellett, it was like uh, just kind of like whew, right, right over your head. You, you like I well, heard what so he said, sorry. but well, John says it. John says it in in uh, uh, twenty uh, uh, verse eight when the, the other disciple that was John who reached the tomb 
first. Him and Peter run to the tomb. Yeah. John outruns him. He looks inside. Peter comes up running and just goes on in. Yeah. And they look in and they see it. And John says he saw and believed. And then parentheses, he said, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then they run back to the house like they're disappointed because they don't know what's yeah. going to happen now yeah. until he actually appears to them. Somewhere between there and I don't know how much exactly how much time passed from his death till they gathered up in Jerusalem and, 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 and the, the story unfolds about the kingdom being established. I don't know how long it was, but you it was 50, long. 49 days there. Something changed their the minds. I guess once they saw him and touched him, and like Thomas and everybody said, and he's eating fish with them, you know, right. somewhere in there they said, man, this is what he was talking about. <laughs> he said, you'd think about that, Al. That would be a jump well, up and down experience there. It, and they kind of struggled that the whole time. Let's, let's take another break. So, Mike, do you have a security system at your house? Do you have cameras and stuff up? Um, I am the security system at my house. <laughs> you uh, sound like Dad. <laughs> <laughs> he says he is 911. It is. Actually, Dad's got Dogs a lot of cameras. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I probably rifles. should have. You know, I know you get a discount on your insurance, some of that kind of stuff. So uh, You do. And so there's a, the, one of our sponsors is a great company. So, Mike, you need to check these guys out. They're called Simply Safe. And their main thing is sensors and cameras, you know, because nowadays the cameras tell you what's going on. You know, that's, and that's the crooks. They say the cameras, typically they're going to go past your house to the one that doesn't have it. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes to set it up. Super easy. Uh, comes to your house. There's no long-term contract, no hidden fees, no installation costs. You do it yourself. So for the listeners, if you want to uh, get a free home security camera, uh, which is what they're going to do if you check these guys out. Go to Simply Safe, S I M P L I Safe dot com slash unashamed. You get sixty day free risk trial, which is really awesome, and you get a free security camera. Simply Safe dot com slash unashamed. I'm doing some prep for this Sunday sermon, and um, which I'm kind of picking up where Mike left off yesterday, and in Luke 24. It was another one of those instances, and it actually happens before he appears to the group in the room. You know, Jesus just shows up in between two, to these two disciples, two of them, Cleopas and another one. That's and, right. And they're walking down the road, oh, yeah. and, and he, and he, but he, it says they couldn't recognize him. And it's funny because Mark said it this way, he, he kept them from recognizing him. Yeah. So so he he's doing stuff with this glorified body now. He's a shapeshifter or something. I mean, I, I can't wait to, to find out what this, because we're going to be like him one day. So he's walking along, but he asked him, he says, well, what, what's your boys talking about? And they were like, well, are you some kind of visitor to Jerusalem? I mean, have you missed out on what's been going on around here? And he said, well, what? I love it, because he, he wanted to get, hear what they were thinking. So then they start into it. Well, they missed the whole boat. They were like, he was a prophet. We thought he was going to redeem Israel. You know, they, they give him the feedback, you know. And then he's like, have you, have y'all not, do you not understand it? See, he, he went from that moment, he went back to Moses and all the Old Testament scriptures about himself and explained it to him again. So then, it, then he was, he kept walking. He, he acted like he was just going to walk away, you know. And they were like, whoa, would you come eat with us? I mean, we, we want to hear some more about this. They still don't know it's him. They sit down at the table. They're thinking he's going to spend the night. They break bread. As soon as he breaks the bread, all of a sudden they look up and it's him. And then it said he disappeared. I mean, vanished from the table. And so I've, I've been reading that. I, I thought, man, what? first of all, look at the cool stuff he could do. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He didn't do any of that stuff before. I don't know if that was the change for now that he's in a glorified body it says, or uh, what. You know How Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. But they still thought he was a ghost. That's right. You know, they was thought he was a ghost. And he said, ghost? A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. Right. So there was something about he looked, he, he was very similar, but I guess there was a difference. <laughs> well, he but, still had the scars, too. Yeah. You know, then he the quotes Christian. what was written. He opened their minds so they could under. He told them, look, this is what is written. That's why it's so critical when people start asking questions. Just give them what's written. Give them what's written. 
This is what's written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name of all nations beginning in Jerusalem. We're living proof how we're 2,000 years or so since that time. We are still doing precisely what they did. Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead. Right. First importance. And you would think at a time like, uh, this always gets me, a time like Christmas, I mean, Christmas is right here on us. That ought to be a time when when people are more conscious, at least it seems to be, they're more conscious of the, at least the birth of Christ. I'm telling you. But you think about his birth, light busted into the darkness of night when he was born. When he dies, just the opposite happens. In the middle of the day, darkness comes when he's on the cross for three hours. Yep. And darkness comes into the middle of light. Yep. And then out of that, of course, the light of the world comes out of the tomb, and then it's it's on then with getting the gospel in the world. It and is the wildest story I've ever read, but here's the here's the the, the kicker. I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> right. Well, and you're right, Mike. That uh, that's interesting because the so this it goes dark, and you remember he told them when they showed up to take him, he told that crowd of people, he said, "This is your hour when darkness reigns." Remember when he said that? Yeah. And so what was about to happen was the darkest time in human history, for forever. And and you're right; it's like in that moment of his death. I mean, literally, it was dark, and that's right before he, you know. Well, Satan, Satan thinks he's done something marvelous. He yeah. thinks he's won. That's right. And we talked about it on the podcast. He thought he had killed God. Or Basically, least, we're know. done with him. Yes, exactly right. And, and then what was so significant about it was Satan knew he had never sinned because he tempted him personally to try to get him to you know listen to him. He, he told him, he said, bow the knee to me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus says, I worship the Lord my God and him only. Was his answer, and he already was the king. Really, the cross is is that enthronement of the King of Kings, which was written on the sign on on the cross. That's right, King of the Jews. They They didn't they didn't like like what 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 was written. The Jews tried to get him to say, "No, it's just said that he is." But Pilate didn't. He he actually wrote, "He's the King of the Jews." Peter reminded them they murdered him, thinking they were rid of him, but it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And when that began to sink in, some of the ones who were there in Acts chapter 2, the Jews from all over the world, yeah. they were the ones who were hollering, crucified. That's right. All of a sudden, they hear, uh, by the way, when y'all murdered him, his death removed sins like murder, like That's what right. you just did. That's why his final words were, forgive him, and it was a way they could be saved. Can you imagine what they felt when they said, ah, we thought we were getting rid of him, but his death's going to save us and give us eternal life. Do you just think about a story like that, Al? That's a that's a barn burner there. Oh man! Well, let's let's talk about that because I, I want to talk to him today about the statements he made, and you just mentioned one of them because he said basically he has seven statements that are recorded throughout the four gospels, and one of them we talked about one last time, but the one you just mentioned, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Yep. And and that comes out of the in in Matthew twenty seven forty two, you remember they said he saved himself. I mean he he saved others, but he can't he save himself. Can't. That was that when they were looking at him, they were like, look at this poor sack. You know he he claimed that he could you know save other people, but look at him hanging on the cross, can't even save himself. Now you think about the power of that statement in in the middle of his dying, physically dying. He's a human being. He's experiencing this thing. Yet his thought is about the people that are committing the crime that he desires them to be forgiven of this. And they're insulting him in the moment. Yeah. You know, that's an insult. Well, you, you could save your others, but you can't save yourself. I mean, he was insulted and dying, and yet you're right. And it was a prayer. He says, Father, yeah. <laughs> for, forgive them. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. But boy, he got that right. They did not know what they were doing. They really didn't. So let's, uh, let's take another break. So one of my favorite sponsors uh, is, a, is a company called Helix Sleep. They make a super comfortable uh, they make a super comfortable mattress 
And so the Jace got the mattress because we got one to try. So Jace, you so know, how did Jace come about getting the one to? Well, try? because he's cheap. You know, this is the deal. <laughs> he, he he's always looking for free stuff. That's why. So I was like, man, I, I missed out. But I was able to buy myself one. So I went in and bought one from these guys because I heard Jace talking about how good it was. And I have to say. It is fantastic. So if you have any back issues, Kellett, you may want to check out Helix Sleep. So if you go to helixsleep.com slash unashamed, basically they have about a two-minute sleep quiz that you take, and that's just to figure out do you like a soft mattress, hard mattress, you know, the firmness and stuff like this. It's got a 10-year warranty. You can also try it for 100 nights risk-free. That's the third of a year. So there's no way to lose on this. Uh, They'll pick it up, but trust me, you won't want to send it back. So here's what you do. Uh, Helix is offering up to $200 off of all mattress orders and two free pillows, which is awesome, for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash unashamed. So go to helixsleep.com slash unashamed. Get that $200 off. Get those two new pillows and start enjoying your sleep. But I was thinking about this, Mike. You, you know, I've heard people say this before. We've had some friends of ours that kind of came up with this idea that forgiveness doesn't have to be extended or offered if people don't ask for it. Have you heard this before where yeah. they're like, you know, you, in other words, even from God, you, it has to be asked for to receive. But I look at this passage as well as several others where Jesus would heal people, and which is what they were asking for, but then he would say, you're forgiven of your sins. Well, they never asked about that, but he was trying to tell them that's more important than you can walk now. Yeah, so do, I mean, I, I don't know what happened there in the hearts of those people. Uh, do you think they were all just instantly forgiven? I mean, who knows? You know, I, or or like Dad said, are they the ones that were there? Some of the, you know, some of them were oh, in Acts two. In Acts two, oh, there were some of them for that, sure. Then recognize that, you know, maybe so, that was so the, the point forgiveness. Of it. Is uh, he's definitely by by the fact he's dying, he's making forgiveness available. To them, it's not just a verbal thing. Right, that's right. It's his death that's making it available. Well, I've had a lot of situations, and and Lisa and I experienced it ourselves. You know, we she when our book we talk about her being molested as a child, and it caused all kinds of problems, as you can imagine, for her, for us, for relationships, and it almost wrecked our marriage. And so, but we just never had really understood how to deal with that. Well, so when, when we were the wonderful counselor, and one day in one of our sessions. There was we came in, sat down where there was a chair sitting there that wouldn't wasn't normally there. And so we start, you know, we pray, we talk about she's giving us stuff to talk about. And we wound up having that person in that chair to forgive. Because both of us had held on to so much stuff for so long and we didn't want to have a relationship with this person. Uh, I don't want him around my family. But we needed to release his hold on us. And I think that's one of the things about forgiveness. A lot of times people have stuff in their past. Maybe someone has died and you had this bad relationship, one of your parents or, you know, or your kid or something. How do you get past that? The only thing you can do is release that to God and offer forgiveness. And I, that's what I see in this moment with Jesus. This is what he's saying. You want to have a heart that even if people wrong you, that you can extend forgiveness. And, and the capacity to be able to do that. I don't think though it's hard to do without understanding Christ, mm. you know? Yeah. To forgive someone that has just done something terrible yeah. to you. Right. Well, Jesus knew that better than anybody right there. In, That's right. Across. But cause he never sinned. Difficult. He never sinned, never treated anybody bad, never made a mistake toward the relationship. And yet there they are hollering for his mm-hmm. death. That's exactly right. But, for, but to answer your question, they would have to, they would have had to come to repentance sure. before they could be forgiven. This is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and then this, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you don't repent, you're still shaking your fist at him right. saying we're yeah, they they thought they were getting rid of him well in people's hearts. They say, No. Uh, right. No. You know, I'm not bowing my knee to anyone, right. including God. So. My my point is our hearts need to be like Jesus' heart was. If someone wrongs us, our first capacity, our first instinct should be 
I want to extend forgiveness. You yep. know, now that doesn't mean like this person I mentioned. I don't want a relationship with this person, but I, people hold old, on old hurts and wounds onto people, and and if you don't release that, you're going to live in a lot of bitterness. Well, not you know? only do you not forgive them, most of the time you can't forgive yourself. That's right. Which you is can't the, usually the hardest it, one. You can't practice it one way. You can't practice it back towards either. Yeah, right. hate mail comes my way from time to time. Every once in a while, they show me one of them. You know where they're, you know, your mother, they're, they're cussing me, and someone says, "What do you do about that?" I said, "I don't hold it against them. I just go on, give them a little time. They may get off that." That's right. So yeah, you just it it goes right off your back. I take it as a badge of honor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You well, know? because we say Jesus was persecuted, so shall we be, right? So sure. so you mentioned repentance. The the next statement I want to do is today you will be with me in paradise which is what he says to one of the two thieves. Yep. Remember, one guy is like, oh, this guy is, you know, nothing. Well, actually, they're both doing that at the beginning. Right. They're both sneering and mocking him. And then, <clears throat> for whatever the reason, I think it's when he hears Jesus say, Father, forgive them. When he when that thief hears him say that toward that group, yeah, he, might. he starts looking at him, and he's already heard something about him being king because he says, remember me yeah. Yeah. in your kingdom. Yeah. yeah. And when so, you come into your kingdom, Luke well, 23. He has right? a ch- change of heart. I mean, and uh, and Jesus says he's going to. Yeah. What a what a great thing to hear from the voice of Christ. I'm telling you. About your about Woo. your eternal destiny. Hey, today you'll be with me. I'm taking that. I'm Hey, gonna... that's cutting it pretty close <laughs> <off>. <laughs> <laughs> And it also I, I love the idea when I mean, you're that... strung up on a on a cross yourself and you're looking over there and you're like, you know, this is a long shot, but Remember me over here. I'm I'm sitting here. I'm hanging right beside but you. Look at it, look, but look at his faith because Jesus is hanging right there with him. Yeah. It's obvious they're all going to die today. And he looks over and says, okay, when you come into your kingdom, well, when was that going to happen? Well, he had heard to, John or somebody. He, he figured it out somehow. He, he knew yep. that it was going to be post this yep. guy dying. That's how much. Now, that takes some faith right there, which is pretty amazing. By the way, that's a strong text to let you know. That the kingdom did come back then. That's right. There. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. This, this thousand years in the future, you know, it's not. And also, I think it also, we've talked about this before. There's some text about, I know some people have, in Ephesians, have talked to, and Peter about Jesus going into hell, you know, and all this stuff from there. He was whatever. But it, to me, that this is a pretty clear picture that he, he hung out with whatever he, he was calling paradise. He said today that we're going to be there. So, you know, wh- wherever your spirit goes, however that works, of course, Jesus came back, you know, was the difference in him. The other old boy didn't. But at the same time, he got in the kingdom, you know, because he had faith. And you couldn't have talked him into coming back once he's there. That's exactly right, which is what we always say. Uh, so here's another one. Um, well, let's take a break. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And that's in our John text that we've been talking about. And he's talking to the apostle John and Mary. Uh, his mother, when he says that. And so I think I've always thought that part of that was the idea that, you know, she was, we we're assuming since we don't read anything about Joseph that he's gone. So she's a widow, we assume. And now Jesus is fixing to be gone. And so he needs, he's wanting somebody to take care of his widow mom because, like we talked about in, th- in this culture, especially, a widow didn't have, I mean, you're in a bad spot. You don't have a man take care of you in this culture. Now, he, uh, he did have some brothers. But it ain't like Jesus been going around making money. That's right. Either and putting he didn't have a place to, to lay. His but head. you know, Mary uh, <laughs> probably when he was a boy and he deserted them when they were in there traveling, and they they looked for him. You know, go back and trying to figure out where he was he when was they 12. went in there. He was talking to all these Jewish scholars. I mean, sparring with them, and but said Mary, you know, they said, "What are you doing?" He said, "Like well, I'm doing my father's business here." Little kid talking twelve to these, years old. These brains, uh, Bible brains, but it says Mary. From that day on, she cherished that mm-hmm. in her heart. Because if you got your son, you're about ten years old, mm-hmm. sitting in there. But she thought something about him. I mean, think about it. She she, she pondered was, these things in her heart. Well, yeah, what says. yeah, yeah. And then there's Pretty another cool. text where she did that too. There's a couple of times where it yeah. says she did that. And you know what I love about it is Jesus again. I mean, she she knew all the time he's the one. Yeah. And what he's what what was to me awesome about it is that Jesus 
shows her respect as his mother, yep. and it shows his humanity. I mean, Jesus came. This is his mom. She I had think him and she, she raised probably him. knew this is this is how it's going to end. Yep. You know, because you know, good and well, she heard somebody say, "Well, he said he's going to die. Right. In three days, be raised from the dead." She's like, "Ooh, yeah, that'd be pretty tough on a mom." I thought that's one of the things that Gibson captured so powerfully in the Passion was his relationship with Mary. And you yep. said that with any mother, it's just this 33-year-old son. That's your son. That's going through this. You know, I mean, it'd, be, it'd be terrible. Yeah, and, and the respect and love he had for his mom. Yeah. Uh, I thought, well, there's a whole there's a whole lesson there our culture needs to hear right now. Yes, sir. About how to treat your parents and how to yep. how to honor them and take care of them. And I love it that he's, he basically called on his best friend to be the one to take care of her. And he know? does. He takes him into. He takes her into his home. We well, remember there was there were some issues between Jesus and his family, the brothers and stuff, throughout. Because remember one time they were trying to do a PR thing with him. If you're going to be a public figure, you need to go do this. But you know, that's, I don't think he trusted them as much as he trusted. That John. is quite the statement. He looks at his mother, woman. Behold your son. Yeah. Like, look at me. Yeah. Right. I, I love it. And basically, he's making him a, a blood brother is what, is what happens. That brings tears to my eyes. That's very powerful. So you know what a powerful uh, relationship, though, that is to know that uh, at your death that you can put the care of someone that that, that you, you're like your mom into somebody else's hands and you can know it's been yeah. okay. Yeah. So that's a good thing to know. That's a well, you great know, Mike, relationship. You, you and I have been at a lot of deathbeds with as many years as we've been in ministry. And and I can safely say that almost every time when a person is drawing near to death, if they still have some awareness, they're they're thinking about family. They're thinking about taking care of the wife, the kids. The I mean, we've seen when we've had some great brothers and sisters that have become part of the cloud of witnesses, right? Oh yeah. But but it's at that moment where you do think about family. You know, you want them to be taken care of. You don't want them to carry on the legacy that you know, especially as believers. And you want things to be right with your family. That's exactly right. Yeah, which which should be. Uh, uh, what about, so he said, I thirst in John nineteen twenty eight, um, which, and then of course they, they give him the, um, they, they put it in some vinegar, which I've always read, Mike, that, that, that That's was Psalm 69, right? It's way. a, yeah, it's a, uh, Psalm 69, 21. It's a fulfillment of a prophecy. Yeah. Uh, they also gave me gall for my food and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And so that was how in the world would the psalmist know that? <laughs> <laughs> All those years ago, right? Woo! And yes. here was the moment. It was kind of like a like a pain reliever, maybe. Yeah, that's was kind what, of the that's idea. That's what they say yeah. that uh, that the wine or vinegar on the hyssop uh, right. deal that was on the stick would help deaden the pain. And yeah. so that's why they offered, but he refused it. He didn't take it, which was interesting. Although he said he was thirsty. Uh, mm. Of course, the the last two statements. Uh, it is finished. In John nineteen thirty, which is really a powerful statement because he's right at the moment of death, and so obviously his life was about to be finished. But I think obviously he went way more than that. I mean, he's talking about the whole plan, which you talked about earlier. It this is what I came here to do, and so I just think that moment that he says that you know is, is as much for. God, whoever was listening for us today, I mean, in the moment of death, the whole plan. It's all done. It's in, it's just one word in the, in the yeah. Greek. It's just one word, and it just means complete. It's completed, finished, paid for, all those terms, at the different ways it was used. But it's real funny because some people look at the cross almost like, okay, he had to die, and God, because God was angry at sin, and he had to punish it. I, I, yeah. get, I get that perspective, but it's really more about that God is really displaying his love for mankind. It's really where heaven touches earth. That's I right. mean, it's the love of heaven on an undeserving earth yep. that happens. Which is cross. Ephesians 1. In yeah. love, that was the plan before the creation of the world. So we've talked about this before, before Last he even made the universe. We, we mentioned God made him... Uh, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that's what was going on at that moment. But you look at it and you say, boy, whew. I'm just thinking the ramifications of what he did for that, for that 
act. Yeah. And every Jew got it. It was the Passover. Yep. They all knew that the blood of a lamb had to be had to be shed at the Passover. Yep. And so not only did it bring up when he's the lamb of God and they see his blood shed, it brings up all that message, but also brings up the message of the Exodus. That, right. that there's deliverance this, through this yep. sacrifice. And that was yep. the whole, in uh, John 19, 31 through 37, he was pierced. Normally they come and they break their legs because then they can't breathe anymore. They can't, you know, so that's how they kill him. And I assume that's what happened to the two thieves. But in Jesus' case, you know, he's already said all this stuff. He's, he's dead. The guy recognized it. They don't break his legs, and they just run a spear in his side. And, but that fulfilled a bunch of prophecies in Exodus 12 and Numbers 9. And the, 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 what that thing was there was you had a Passover lamb, and God said, don't break any of the bones in the lamb. And that's exactly the prophecy they were pointing to over Jesus. He is the Passover lamb. And every one of those Pharisees that was after his oh, eye the whole time, they instantly knew that prophecy had been fulfilled. It's they exactly got right. it. They, they didn't it. miss it. They knew. They knew. Yeah. Psalm 34, 20, Zechariah 12, 10, all those said he was pierced for us. And the last thing I want to mention, because we're almost out of time, is that when he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, uh, in Luke 23, you can see that, or Matthew 27. In that moment when he said that and he dies, the, the uh, temple in between the Holy of Holies and the Most Holy Place was ripped in half. And yeah. The earth shook. I mean, it was, it was a moment when this happened on the whole earth. I mean, we had already had this eclipse or whatever was going on with the darkness. And so in that moment, God was saying, that's it. Now there's access to, to me. And you don't go through a temple. You don't go through a little you know, unspotted lamb. Now, matter of fact, he destroyed the very way that you could prove your Jewish heritage to try to say I'm justified by Abraham. That's right. When he tore the temple thing down, that when that it. thing come crashing, all of a sudden you realize I can't be right by God by my physical birth. It's got to be by a new birth. It's a lot about Jesus giving us access to the Father. That's right. The whole book of Ac- Hebrews. Yes, yeah. access, access. That's exactly right. And you know what's interesting, Mike? I always wondered did they try to put another one back up because you know they tried to keep it going until eighty seventy. So I wonder if somebody had to come in there and try to sew that thing back together. But God was like, "That's over. That's yep. done." Yep. That's not going to happen anymore. Mm. Pretty good stuff. Great Thanks, point. Mike, for being here today. Oh, it's been fun. Look, I appreciate what the uh, the program does, the podcast, one for our church, but my, more importantly, just getting people back to, to reading the Bible. I, I encourage um, all your listeners out to, uh, look, just open your Bible, spend some time every day uh, reading God's Word. It has, uh, He made us. He knows best how we ought to function. That's right. So look at it. And that's where you find your guidance. Uh, don't get caught up too much in everything going on in the culture. Uh, our our confidence is in this. You have faith over fear. You you have peace over panic, and you have health over harm. Mm-hmm. And that'll help you in the things that we kind of. Are struggling with their own culture, right? I bet you. You know, it's a true preacher when he has three points. Got and three like, points, and there's good alliteration and, in there too. And I didn't even pass the hat. <laughs> <laughs> he did, and he didn't even have notes, which is really good. So, if you want to check out more of Mike, um, if you if it's the first time you've heard uh, about him, you can go to wfrchurch.org. And Mike and I, our sermons are on there. And then Mike has a thing called Peak of the Week, which is some really good stuff on Wednesday. Well, I couldn't partner with a better guy preaching. Well, it's, I feel it's, the same way. It's it's a it's fun. I said Mike Kelly is together. one of the best men I know. And uh, I stand by that, Mike. So thanks for coming into the uh, to the lair. On oh, Unashamed. thanks, brother. It's been great. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.